Welcome to everybody. Welcome, especially to our guest of honor, Rip Rapson, who is not, who is not who is definitely not new to this um, event. Um, we we've had Rip has probably come to more of these talks that he presents than any other single speaker, and that's because we we are, we are all hanging on the edge, waiting to hide, find out what is happening in Detroit. After, We've been kept posted usually about every two years. And so when Rip, when I called up Rip about it, he said, oh, sure, I'll be glad to come. And of course, when we set this up, the date that we thought it was going to be in person, he, unfortunately, he doesn't get a dinner out of this. Uh, and, we don't get a, and the students don't get a chance to meet him. But nonetheless, he's here. He's here. And, he, and we're all looking forward very much uh, to hearing you know, what he has to say. As you know, um, uh, Rip is the president of the Kresge Foundation. Uh, it is also the case that before he went to the Kresge Foundation, uh, he was the president of the um, of Mick Foundation in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It is the, it's the McKnight Foundation. Uh, and he led all kinds of wonderful efforts there, uh, including early childhood development efforts, Regional Public Private Philanthropic and Economic Development Organization, Enhanced Environmental Protections Along the Mississippi River. And before he went to the McKnight Foundation, he was the Deputy Mayor of Minneapolis with responsibility for designing a $400 million neighborhood revitalization problem, um, revamping the municipal budgeting process and elevating the city's commitment to children and families. And of course, when he came to the Kresge Foundation, um, he brought many of his interests, talents to bear when he got here. And he has been the driving soul and driving energy behind the Kresge Foundation's efforts to transform itself from being a foundation that had mainly funded building projects to one that seeks to improve opportunities for people who are living in American cities, including the home, his hometown Oh, the, the foundation's home down of Detroit. So, you know, it's it's a real privilege to have Rip back. I told him he looked like he was just beaming in, in my picture. And, and that's really a, a, a revelatory of how excited he is to be here. And that's almost as excited as we are to have him here. And so welcome, Rip. Welcome all of you all who come out on this nice day to hear Rip give us an update of what's going on in Detroit. Thank you, Joel. That's so kind. Uh, before you all joined, Joel and I were talking about uh, the deep pleasure I take from uh, talking with the Ferg group uh, and, and and to travel to to Raleigh. I'm uh, I really do miss it. It's become part of my routine over the last decade, and uh, this will have to have to do. But thank you all for for taking the time and the energy to. To, to tune in. Um, as Joel suggested, what I thought I would do would be to sort of continue a tradition of tracking the Detroit experience that uh, Joel and I started probably almost 15 years ago. Um, and what I thought I might do is to sort of understand a little bit uh, with you how the role of philanthropy has sort of proceeded through those subsequent years and how in this time um, it, it presents itself. Um, a couple of disclaimers is that um, Joel wrote into our contract 15 years ago that uh, every time I appeared at Duke, I needed to come with these schematic drawings that I've done. And so uh, th this time is no different. I, um, I have uh, strange, odd, idiosyncratic drawings that I'll share with you. I worry a little bit that the screen will make them a little bit hard to decipher, but uh, but I, I encourage you to think about these sort of more impressionistically, and I'll walk you through sort of the broad concepts, not to worry about small little handwritten uh, hand entries or or the, the nuance of these things. Um, the second disclaimer is that this is a, a particularly Kresge-centric walk through philanthropic engagement. Um, I've 
I, I encourage you all to sort of push in with your perspectives about how philanthropy in your worlds has perhaps differed in its approach to some of the questions we'll talk about today. But um, for my part, I think I'm gonna at least put on the table uh, the sort of the, the Kresge platform and hope that it has some relevance. And third, um, I think the, the, the potential power of looking at Detroit is considerable uh, given the year we have been through. In many ways, Detroit represents um, a microcosm of, of cities in America coming off of crisis. Um, and we're obviously not through the crisis, but as we begin to work through the crises and its aftermath, uh, I think we can take some lessons from from where Detroit has been. And so let me let me set the stage that way because way back in 2008 and 2010, Detroit, as many of you know, can remember, uh, was in the throes of just an extraordinary convergence of unfortunate events. Uh, there was the national recession that everyone else was participating in. There was a national housing crisis, foreclosure crisis that everyone else was participating in. But Kresge, uh, pardon me, but Detroit was going through two crises of a very particular kind uh, to our community. The first uh, was the uh, potential bankruptcy of the automobile industry. We had all three autos just hanging on by a thread and two actually out and out declaring bankruptcy with a third all but doing that. And so the private sector had completely retreated. And we had a public sector that turned out to be corrupt. And uh, Mayor Kilpatrick and about 50 of his closest friends within a couple of years were found themselves in the federal penitentiary. And so in 2008, 2010, there was really nobody left standing except philanthropy in Detroit. The private sector really was in a bunker. The, the public sector was in the penitentiary and the nonprofit sector was really just hanging on by a thread. So. Philanthropy had no real choice but to uh, determine whether it was going to step up and, and step forward. Um, and one of the things that uh, attended that was, I think, a, a wide skepticism from external resources, whether it was the federal government, whether it was our funding partners from across the country, um, about the viability of Detroit and about whether there was any coherence to be made about that um, uh, about that period. And so let me um, walk you through a couple of slides that I hope will um, will help reset the, the table just a little bit. In response to a number of inquiries from the federal government, from our own board of directors, from, from others about whether there was any coherence whatsoever to Detroit, I went back into my office, and I think some of you have seen this, uh, drew this diagram, and this is a perfect example of please don't pay any attention to the scribble. Because what this represented was uh, my attempt to identify nine bodies of work across various disciplines in which there was pre-existing effort, there was capital being applied, and where in the aggregate we actually felt that we could make a difference in in helping sort of stabilize the community, at least until we got through all of these crises of recession and foreclosure and bankruptcy. And if you could read this, what you would see is everything from trying to encourage environmental sustainability on the left, to creating a new light rail system in the middle, to um, developing a more built out arts and cultural environment to the right and everything in between. And in many ways, this became sort of scaffolding for uh, about five or six years in Detroit. We were able to get private and public and nonprofit and philanthropic resources sort of aligned enough so that we could sort of hold the dike uh, until people were able to resume their appropriate roles. And it worked pretty well. If you actually had taken this drawing and turned it vertically, um, you could imagine creating work plans for each one of those nine modules of work. And in effect, that's exactly what we did. We identified uh, a group of, of entities to lead each body of work and Kresge and a handful of others sort of had a light touch coordination role to make sure that as we were working on transit, we were working on corridor development. And as we were working on corridor development, we were working on, on land use policy. And it basically held uh, pretty well. 
But then, of course, <laughs> 2013, uh, Detroit experienced its next cataclysm, which was the uh, uh, the bankruptcy of 2013, 2014, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of, uh, of America. And what happened in that bankruptcy was, I think, a revisiting of whether there was, in fact, enough in place so that when all of the financial accounting was done and we balanced our long-term debt and we figured out how to balance the city's budget through the bankruptcy process, there would be enough in place to ensure that we wouldn't fall right back into bankruptcy. And when I was asked to testify in the bankruptcy trial by Judge Rhodes, the bankruptcy judge, that's exactly the question he asked. He said, how do we know that all of this good work will endure? Uh, this is all very particularized work. Um, and once it is accomplished, um, we may find ourselves in the midst of a whole suite of, of additional crises that, that sort of push us right back to where we began. And so what I did for Judge Rhodes um, was to try to reflect back on whether the roles that philanthropy had played in the previous five or six years actually were roles that I felt could kind of carry us into the future. Um, and, and in some ways, the particularized activity, the small business development and light rail and land use and arts and culture and all of that sort of nested within this way of working. And I, it, Judge Rhodes and I had something of a conversation during the bankruptcy trial about whether it was more important to sort of identify particular pinpricks that where we would direct money or whether it was important to sustain a way of working in Detroit that could adapt to differing factors. And I argued that it was the latter, that, that these six roles were really important. Let me just tick them off quickly because I wanna use them as a frame for thinking about the COVID era and the, and the post COVID era. Uh, the first broad um, role was to think about philanthropy as having the capacity to take on some of the really tough issues that often the public or the private sector simply can't reach. In the pre-bankruptcy time, this was clearly issues of blight and land use. It was just, it was the third rail of politics. People couldn't touch it, but philanthropy could convene around it. We could invest in mechanisms that would uh, deliver a different kind of land use policy for the city. And that's exactly what we did. Second was fortifying the capacity to actually get things done. Um, the city was so, um, Enervated during this sort of 2008, 2013, 14 era, that we had to figure out ways that both the public sector had deeper capacity, the private sector had deeper capacity, and the, and the nonprofit sector had deeper capacity just to take on basic problem solving roles. And there were a whole suite of investments we made, particularly as this drawing suggests, if you can see it, um, in the realm of community finance. We had no community development finance institutions in Detroit in 2008. And by the time we hit 2013, we had four or five who were robust and doing good work. The third role I suggested to Judge Rhodes was peeling away the outer layer of risk to activate private markets. That there are just too many transactions in Detroit that didn't pencil out. And so having uh, philanthropy, sort of seed money, safety gap money, um, would help projects get done that could actually demonstrate to the markets that there was a market there, or that at least over time we could build markets. So we did this with small business development, we did this with a small commercial development, uh, we created funds, we invested in holding companies, we did a whole suite of things we could talk about more if you'd like. Uh, the fourth role was uh, a mouthful, sort of serving as a guarantor of value. The idea was that there were investments that philanthropy could make that would signal to the market that the public spaces and the public commons of the city were sufficiently healthy and stable to merit long-term private sector investment. This would be the uh, Detroit Riverfront, the light rail project, um, an anchoring park downtown, big, big common uh, uh, space projects that, that I think actually achieved what they sought to accomplish. Fifth was acting as a Sherpa, just providing ground truth for those of, the, of our financial partners or our government partners who wanted to be involved in Detroit, but didn't understand the ground truth. It was incoherent or overly political or too complex or just um, a dumpster fire. 
And so what we found is the drawing suggested there, there were logical touchdown points and places of entry for other folks to be helpful. And sixth, and finally, the idea that philanthropy could steward the really fragile ecologies of human services, human development organizations, uh, the emerging system of uh, fresh food access, um, arts and culture, a whole suite of things that the private markets don't do a very good job of protecting. So the question for the judge, I think, was clearly framed. But then he asked, of course, the important question of whether that would hold once we um, once we return to elected government. Remember, we uh, Detroit was placed under receivership, but when Mayor Duggan was elected post-bankruptcy, there was a question of whether these roles would continue to have any relevance in a, in a new regime where the bankruptcy had reset the table and elected officials were again in charge. And the short answer is, as I think that drawing by being labeled 2008 to 2020 suggests is the answer was yes. That what, what these roles manifested in were very different kinds of things. So for example, in, in the table setting, we moved away a little bit from the land use work, which it came to a logical conclusion and moved into developing a, a, a system of early childhood education, sort of right on the shoulder of education reform policy that was just too difficult for the, uh, for the other sectors to touch. Um, and as we thought about, uh, for example, uh, acting as a steward for external resources, we increasingly looked outward to try to understand whether there weren't practices and policies from other parts of the country that we could import to, to Detroit and, and with efficacy. That in turn then ushers in, of course, the latest set of dislocations of 2020. And the, 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 the interesting premise here is whether in fact the kind of disruption ushered in by COVID, by the racial justice movement, uh, by the economic distress that we've all um, experienced um, can actually survive one more, uh, can actually implicate these roles with one more turn of the wheel. Um, and I, uh, I wanna spend the rest of my time talking about that. But to do that, I think it's important to, to just put a pin in exactly what philanthropy has done for this last year, because I think it's been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, on the top, you'll see just the four, for convenience purposes, the four pillars of the Biden administration's priorities, but the, the racial equity and justice bucket, the economic rebuilding bucket, the pandemic recovery bucket have been with us even before the Biden administration. And as you all know as well as I, um, philanthropy has been enormously active in this space. Um, every community in America, individuals, private donors, uh, private philanthropy like Kresge have participated in pool funds for nonprofit stabilization, small business stabilization, uh, grantee stabilization. Uh, we've um, uh, helped get um, uh, the word out, we've helped uh, in innumerable ways to try to get our communities through, through the crisis. And down at the bottom, I, I would just sort of group the roles into three broad, immediately responsive roles that we, we pooled funds, uh, we provided grantee support, and some, uh, some of our colleagues even went so far as to issue uh, private placement bonds to um, help raise additional capital for either racial justice or pandemic recovery or for economic revitalization. The public outreach and communications was tremendously important. This is not something that most municipal governments or state governments have a lot of um, discretionary resources to uh, take advantage of. A philanthropy has stepped in in a big way in underwriting some of those costs. And we are also able to help connect people who are in similar circumstances. Human service agencies across the country are facing the same set of issues and places like Kresge can help create networks of conversation and exchange of practice that were, have been very helpful. But then the, the little blue bridge, I think is tremendously important. What we found was that so much of the help coming down from Washington was simply not translating into help on the ground in real ways. And I'll come back to that in a moment. It just wasn't reaching 
the folks in greatest need, whether that was small businesses and micro businesses, whether it was um, PPP not getting to where it needed to, whether it was vaccines not getting into communities. Um, it, there have been a whole suite of shortcomings in which uh, philanthropy has been helpful in making sure that those in greatest need actually benefited from what needed to be done. So again, the question is, this is 2020, we're now 2021. Do the six roles I described earlier have application in sort of building out from this suite of issues into sort of what's next? And so what I'd like to do quickly is walk through uh, the six roles um, and suggest that in each one of them, there is a fundamentally different um, point of focus from what we've seen before. Um, again, the role is similar, but the manifestation of how that role plays out in local community is quite different. So let me start with the first role. And you'll remember that that is philanthropy helping set the table for really difficult community conversations that the public sector often isn't particularly well equipped to take on. Um, and so um, here, here is the, the sort of the, the, the obstacles of of COVID sort of emerging on the other side, theoretically. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through each one of these six uh, um, one at a time. So the first one I believe is going to be philanthropy's role in helping reimagine and reposition the public health system. Um, it's easy to be skeptical about this one. Our public health system is so big and so complex and so riddled with inertias uh, that it's hard to imagine philanthropy actually playing a determinative role in helping reimagine it. But this is where working locally is really important because our national healthcare system is very different from a public health system that plays out on the ground. And these four or five interventions, I think are things you're gonna see in community after community in America. Uh, and it's got to not be led by philanthropy, but it's got to be aided and abetted by philanthropy. The first is clearly maternal and childhood health. If the pandemic has shown us nothing else, it is the differential impact that um, these kinds of uh, traumas to our health system uh, uh, play in marginalized and disadvantaged communities. And you've got to start early. You've got to start with moms and expectant moms and and early childhood screening and all of the suite of activities that you see over there in the brown um, egg. Um, in Detroit, for example, we're gonna continue building out our early childhood system. We're gonna open in uh, August, a new um, multi-purpose early childhood center that is intended to sort of be a central point of, of health access for the community. Uh, I think you'll see a whole suite of things like that. Philanthropy, I think, has also woken up to the idea that housing is not simply putting bricks and mortar in place. It's actually um, a health issue and that housing stability is actually a, a driver of, of poor or good health outcomes. And I think you can just imagine just an avalanche of problems, despite the local, I mean, the, the most recent uh, relief package coming out of Washington, we are going to see an avalanche of issues around eviction, foreclosures, uh, and substandard housing. And this is gonna, I think, drive philanthropy into the housing and health area in a powerful way. I think similarly with environmental health, it's just, there's just no question that the environmental determinants of poor health outcomes is something that uh, we've gotta be paying more attention to. And again, I think it's directly within the wheelhouse of philanthropy. Um, trying to integrate human development systems, human service agencies more fully with community-based care, I think is, is something that had already begun before COVID and its need is gonna be simply um, accentuated tenfold afterward. And things like access to fresh food become equally critical. Um, this, is, um, this is tough stuff. Um, the, the, the private sector orientation of our healthcare system makes these seem sort of like marginal interventions, but they're not. Uh, I think what we've seen in Detroit is increasingly these kinds of interventions actually have huge influence on our, on our, our institutional healthcare system. And we're already beginning to see substantial movement. The second role 
is the um, is the uh, the role that before COVID manifested largely in building the capacity of community-based organizations, whether it was in finance or leadership development or the rest. I think going forward, clearly the role will play out in terms of racial justice. Um, I can think of few things in my lifetime that have changed the thermostat of philanthropy more profoundly than the racial justice um, intensification um, over the last year. Uh, it was obviously precipitated by George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but it was a much deeper, more profound set of pent up energies um, that 2020 really uh, set loose. Going forward, um, I think this changes the way philanthropy thinks, uh, both externally and internally. And what I've thrown up on the screen here is a depiction of how that has played out at, at Kresge. Um, down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a suite of interventions we've done to try to underwrite um, investment in racial justice organizing across the country. But the other parts of the book um, are as important. It, the idea that as an employer, as an economic entity, as a community citizen, and as a community unto itself, Kresge and I think other philanthropies are going to have to embrace um, racial justice in a very different way is, is clearly correct. Just one quick example, our investment team, and in, you know, and in many phil philanthropies, invest, the investment team is sort of parked down the road or in New York and doesn't have much to do with, with the programmatic priorities of a place. But in Kresge, uh, we've decided that it racial equity needs to be every bit as much a part of our investment portfolio as it is um, a part of our programmatic portfolio. And our team has diversified its own makeup. It's um, indicated that it will have 25% of its domestic fund managers be people of color or led by women um, by 2025. Um, it's, uh, we're going to open up our procurement and contracting processes to make sure they're representative of our local community. There are a whole suite of of things uh, that I think end up redefining internally to an organization what it means to be committed to issues of racial justice. And first and foremost, we ourselves have to be a diverse and inclusive organization. Um, and I think philanthropy as a whole is, is striding rapidly in that direction. And I have to give um, Darren Walker at Ford enormous credit. I think he was out early on these questions and has really set a tone about the importance of equity and inclusion in the work of philanthropy um, and, and we're right behind him. The third, the third role it was the role of peeling back risk and trying to understand um, how it is that we can incentivize private markets um, to move capital to community. Here, I think um, almost as profoundly as the previous slide, um, we are going to see a very different orientation from philanthropy. Um, and I think it is largely going to be the process of building new forms of machinery to deliver uh, capital of all kinds, private capital, public capital, philanthropic capital, into the hands of folks on the front lines. Uh, <laughs> you'll see if you can, I don't know if you can see, but there are all of these goofy machines that I've drawn into this drawing, mostly as a shorthand to suggest that these are um, in many ways, either retrofits, um, retooling, or the invention of entirely new systems. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, the big blue box in the middle has to do with strengthening the community capital absorption capacity. The ability of, of a community to take capital and to distribute it effectively. You would think that's pretty simple. It's not. I guarantee you this has been part of the most difficult struggle we have had in Detroit is often capital is there, but it is simply can't be deployed in ways that are aligned with uh, community priorities. I think what we will see in these next couple of years is a community development finance institution moment. We are going to see, I think, the elevation, the fortification, and the reorientation of community-based lending. They offer products in ways that um, our commercial banking sector and our public sector simply cannot. 
Uh, they can work hand in glove with community development organizations, community development corporations, but they still need um, an enormous amount of tooling because ultimately they take other people's money still. And we have to figure out ways to make sure that the money that moves into the CDFI world comes with fewer restrictions, greater flexibility, um, and greater expectation that they can be deployed toward the things like health clinics and housing and uh, community projects, small business revitalization that I've indicated at the bottom of the drawing. Second, um, the, the pandemic has really shown that microfinance is not something that our capital markets understand at all. 80% of the businesses in the city of Detroit employ two or fewer people. Those are folks who just cannot get bank loans. They don't have a track record with banks. They're not big enough for banks. The, the risk is perceived to be too high. And uh, during the pandemic, Kresge uh, has, I think, done some fairly pioneering work in using our ability to guarantee loans and using our ability to combine loans and grants and equity investments to make sure that uh, money is actually flowing to people of color, working on the ground, trying to, to use small business as a way of building um, their own wealth and community wealth. I think you're gonna see a lot more of this in the coming years. It's tremendously important. And as the, as the nation, I think, grapples with how to build wealth in, com in communities of color, small business is one of the best tickets together, obviously, with, with housing. Um, we're, I think, also going to see rather dramatic changes in the um, Opportunity Zone legislation. This was something that many of you may know was uh, set up during the Trump era to provide uh, capital gains relief taxation relief if you invested in certain zip codes. Uh, it was a very, it is a very clumsy tool uh, with no accountability, no expectations of reporting on, on actual impact. Uh, we've been talking with members of Congress to try to figure out how that can be retooled in this new administration to heighten impact in community and to make these investments much more transparent. It's one thing to have uh, an opportunity zone um, investment in a parking lot or in, in a warehouse, it's quite another to invest it in a, in a business that produces jobs for local residents. And fourth, and, and finally, um, Elwood Hopkins, who's actually on this call and who's a senior fellow at Kresge has been helping us figure out how we can advance community ownership of assets, whether it's through land trusts, a community uh, aggregation of assets around housing, small business development. Elwood is overseeing um, a, a small network of a half a dozen places that are doing this with real energy and uh, innovation. And again, this is, I think, an opportunity for philanthropy to use its discretionary high-risk capital to try some new things. And I think we're going to see that. The fourth role um, is that this notion of guaranteeing value, investing in the kind of public goods that signal to the markets that it's safe to invest. Here, I think we're gonna see a shift from, at least in Detroit, from downtown investments like the Riverwalk, like um, the Anchoring Park, like the M1 rail projects into neighborhoods, and it's much more complicated in neighborhoods. What are the kinds of investments that you can make in the public commons in neighborhoods that help markets and residents believe that there will be stability and uh, long-term health to follow. And here I wanna just use a very uh, particular example, but I think it's a powerful one. Up in Northwest part of Detroit, there was a, an HBCU for all intents and purposes called Mary Grove College. Like small, many small liberal arts colleges, its business plan just wasn't working and it was about to turn out the lights and, and, and it had all sorts of liens and, and claims against its assets and would have likely been sold off in pieces. Uh, it was too central to Northwest Detroit for it to go dark. It's 53 acres, it's a hundred year old institution. It had educated generations and generations of African-American teachers and nurses and social workers. Uh, and we just didn't feel this was something that could just 
uh, go to the highest bidder. So we intervened. Uh, we did workouts of all of the, of the loans, got rid of the debt, um, very complicated process, and then went about trying to figure out how we might repurpose these extraordinary assets to something that was similar to what had been done, but took it into sort of the next generation. And what we came up with, uh, with the help of the community and with the help of a couple of partners I'll mention in a moment, was the idea of creating a P20 campus, a campus in which you would have everything from preschool to K-12 to college to graduate school so that there would be a continuum of educational opportunity on the site, perhaps mixed with other uses, because the, again, the site is 53 acres and can accommodate more than that. And we, we spent the better part of a year trying to identify how you possibly could get traction on that. And then I think, frankly, we got a little bit lucky. The University of Michigan came to us and said, our College of Education is looking to create an entirely new model of teacher training. And we'd love to try that on Marygrove. Well, it turns out that what essentially that involves is a medical residency model where you actually train teachers on site, you um, put them into residency uh, arrangements and the teachers train, uh, teach the teachers and you create this sort of virtuous cycle. The problem was is that we needed um, a K-12 partner to do that. And there uh, we had all sorts of interests from charter schools and private schools and parochial schools. But ultimately the Detroit Public Schools came forward and said they were willing to innovate together with the University of Michigan. And so that we've devised a completely um, uh, unprecedented curriculum for the Detroit public school system. It's, it's been co-designed by the public schools and by the University of Michigan. It's focused on engineering and uh, social activism. It, um, it, uh, it is um, hands-on, it's practice-based, and it's closely connected with sort of community projects. So at any rate, I, this, this drawing is very complicated, but what it suggests is that a con concerted investment in a public commons that has tentacles into community, whether it's educational or whether it's through community connections or whether through the new early childhood center, which is up on the uh, top right, um, that begins to become an anchor for the, the larger community. All of these things kind of conspire to create an anchor for that community that has fundamentally changed investment patterns, has fundamentally um, altered the um, optimism about community residents to be able to attend a neighborhood school, both at the pre-K level and at the K-12 level. And, and the University of Michigan has gone so far as to give preferential uh, admissions treatment to anyone who graduates from the high school. They are automatically admitted to the University of Michigan, which is a big deal. The fifth, um, the fifth role is the Sherpa role, the idea that philanthropy can help people understand ground truth. Uh, and going forward, um, and I think this is gonna be particularly important in the Biden administration where you have a receptivity to sort of local innovation um, and local initiative, philanthropy I think can uh, step out in a very different way. And then essentially, it's a, I think it will become increasingly a question of reverse osmosis that local, practice, local policy, local patterns of behavior will increasingly become sufficiently compelling to sort of work their way up the policy chain to the state and to the federal government. And I think what that will likely look like, at least as I've spoken with the, the Biden folks, is that it will involve less sort of prescriptive policy directives coming out of the federal government then it will be a suite of ideas about how you can deconstruct obstacles to good work. It's pretty simple, right? It's not so simple. Getting rid of regulatory obstacles, um, um, decade old and ossified ways of moving money uh, um, into certain kinds of agencies and certain kinds of circumstances. And then secondly, how you can actually construct an enabling environment so that all of this innovation at the local level sort of has room to breathe and room to, to move. We saw this with the Obama administration in Detroit. We came up with a whole suite of ideas that violated pretty much every federal regulation you could imagine. And the Obama administration was willing to let us breathe those. And as a result, uh, they, they became uh, established in Detroit and were 
working under their influence today. The, the depiction I have here is just one manifestation of how I think Kresge has come at that. And that is some, through uh, an effort we've called the Shared Prosperity Partnership. We went to the Urban Institute, the Brookings, Metropolitan Program within the Brookings Institution and the Aspen Institute and asked if they would be willing to consider listening with us to um, a handful of local communities about what they really needed from either a national funder or a national research and policy and technical assistance provider, rather than sort of just assuming that we could swoop in and, and provide whatever it is we provide, asking Detroit or Memphis or New Orleans or Fresno um, what it is that we could do to be helpful. And we've been doing this now for the better part of four years. And what we have found is that this is enormously constructive, that each of these communities has identified a handful of things for which urban's research capacity is enormously helpful, or Brookings ability to take away apart policy and putting it back together is, is helpful, or Aspen's ability to connect one community of practitioners to another community of practitioners. And I think in the Biden administration, this is essentially the model, is that if you can get these communities to on their own begin innovating, comparing notes across communities, um, and then having that amplified by um, institutions like Urban and Brookings and Aspen and others, you, I think, get to that those little red boxes of what do we need to take apart in order for this to be effective and what do we need to construct in order for it to be effective. Uh, more to follow, but I just, I'm, I'm hoping that we can entice other philanthropies to think about these kinds of platforms because we've found that enormously useful. And the sixth and, and final rule is one that is um, a little um, maybe out of the mainstream, but I, I feel really strongly that the pandemic has shown us just how powerful and important it is. And that is the, the role of arts and culture uh, in helping communities uh, identify, retain, and, and foster dark matter, the sort of the intangibles of community identity, social cohesion, uh, social capital that help communities get through the kinds of times we've gotten through. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but try thinking about the last year without the arts. I mean, it's not so much that um, Broadway wasn't up and running because it couldn't be, but think about what would happen if we didn't have um, uh, music or dance or all of the things that have helped us sort of ennoble our experience. I, th I think if, if you need a shorthand, I mean, our, um, the, the poetry that was read at, at President Biden's inaugural, I mean, just think of the power of the shorthand of all of that. And I think going forward, um, I would, I, I am going to predict that philanthropy is going to take the role of arts and culture in, in community far more seriously. And I think this drawing tries to suggest three ways that might happen. First is fostering much greater diversity and inclusion in the arts and cultural sector. The Ford Foundation has done an enormous amount of work trying to pump large amounts of money into what they call America's cultural treasures. These are uh, historically black led and black serving arts institutions that just need to continue to be on our radar in a powerful way. Similarly, the Mellon Foundation has done very aggressive work trying to place African-American curators in museums of all kind across the country. I think we're gonna see more and more ways to try to understand what next generation support for arts and cultural institutions could look like if the, if the sector itself became more diverse. Up on the left-hand corner in the, in the purple uh, box is the, I think, the obvious role of arts in helping communities organize, helping communities um, work in common purpose toward issues of racial justice and equity. We've already seen this with considerable power, uh, and I think um, philanthropy after philanthropy after philanthropy is, is increasingly embracing this as a, a very important role that arts and culture can play. And then the, the, the brown box is the one that we've spent almost a decade trying to build. This is essentially the shorthand for something called um, Art Place, which was an attempt to integrate arts and culture more fully into the 
community development systems of America, whether that's transportation or infrastructure or health or early childhood development or racial justice, whatever it is. And we have moved through sort of um, a variety of different sectors trying to figure out how is it we can make sure that the ability of the arts to identify problems, to help set the table for problem solving, and then to help implement uh, problem solving in much more creative ways can kind of become embedded in the way we, we conduct community development. And I think the good news here is that we've made enormous strides. We've, we have, um, we, we've placed um, artists in uh, transportation agencies and housing agencies and sheriff's offices all across the country. We've begun to see the sort of the fruits of, of uh, what happens when people realize that arts can reach um, uh, audiences in very different ways and help solve problems in very different ways. So I think, uh, to, to make a long story short, I, I, I suspect that um, in a sort of an unexpected twist, uh, that 2020 will have reminded us just how important arts and culture can be. And when you see that little yellow egg in the middle, it sort of articulates exactly why. This is a, these are vehicles that can bridge across difference and create pathways in a very different way to problem solving. So when you add up all of these six roles looking forward, um, it just seems to me that there are sort of four very broad sort of concluding um, impulses that um, are suggested for, at least for Kresge. First is how very important it is to articulate and adhere to a long-term integrative strategic framework. You just got to know what you're shooting at. You've just got to have a vision of, of what it is you intend to accomplish. And you can piece that out to some extent, but there needs to be an overarching framework that lends coherence and purpose and direction to what you do. And second, and related to that, is that when you do that, you need to reverse engineer your toolbox. You need to make sure that whether it's a loan or a grant or an equity investment or a convening or an active research or a, a, a reach out to a public-private partnership, that you're actually aligning your tools to that larger purpose, that you're um, sequencing your tools properly, that you're pacing them properly, that you're administering them in the right doses properly, because philanthropy has this enormous privilege of being able to use a very wide reaching toolbox. And sometimes I think we under optimize for that. Third, and I, I think the Mary Grove project sort of exemplifies this, is you've just got to calibrate your risk tolerance to be commensurate with the magnitude of the challenge. Sometimes taking a big risk is just simply aggregating a, a number of small actions, and that is perfectly fine. But again, if you sort of tie back to the blue box and say, if what you're trying to accomplish is a, an important big thing, make sure you go big. Um, and again, that can be more than just simply throwing money at a question. It can be all of the reverse engineering that I just described. And fourth and finally, I think we are now entering an era where it's just incontrovertible that every action we take has to be assessed in terms of its impact on the structural drivers of racial inequity. Um, there, the, the, the time has long come and passed, but we, we need to grab it. Uh, this is a time when I think we have enormous opportunity to make real progress in taking aim at the underlying drivers of structural racism and figuring out small ways of chipping away from that. So Joel, I apologize. These are complicated drawings. That's too many words to put into people's laps, but that's all I got. So I, we'll, we'll now uh, move to the audience for comments, but I, I love the presentation. Um, I thought the drawings are even clearer here in the small screen than sometimes they were when you drew them out and distributed them. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to send them along either electronically or otherwise. If if there if, if there's anything in any of that that people would like, I'm happy to share it because they, they are a little easier when you've got them right in front of you. Right. Well, that's fantastic. Well, in any event, um, the floor is now open for comments from um, the, the participants, and I encourage you to uh, ask your questions uh, briefly. And uh, and Imani is going to 
select the people get who actually get called called on. <laughs> uh, I, I when when you when you let off with um, um with the comment about a uh, child ch child and maternal health, I looked over at Brian Comfort, who's in the <laughs> screen here, who is actually started a, a for profit company that concentrates just on child and maternal health. What did you think about what um, what what Rick had, Rip had to say, Brian? Yeah, well, thanks for looping me in on that. And I was thrilled and nice to see you virtually, Rip. We met last yeah. time um, nice down, down there and was just the whole presentation was great. So I definitely want to take you up on being able to see those uh, those those uh, the drawings because there's a lot of great content content in there. Um, but yeah, with Maternal Children's Health, we're actually doing a project. We just got funded from the Kellogg Foundation mm. to um, work with 10 hospitals in Michigan to take uh, their hospital quality improvement efforts outside the hospital walls and yeah. share the power with the community to have the community's voice integrated. So knowing that's in your backyard, um, you know, that's something that, that we're, we're excited about. But I actually did have a question Mm -hmm. um, as well. So one of the things you mentioned is kind of bringing the capital, you know, helping bring capital into those communities and just really appreciating the sophistication that you have with the networks you've developed. Have you ever thought about, you know, doing an Edna McConnell Clark play mm -hmm. and having big bet funders being able to give money that uh, Kresge can help them give that money out? It's so interesting you would ask that Ryan, I, I was just on a call uh, this morning with one of our staff asking them to look at the at the Ed McConnell Clark model. For those of you who don't know, this is um, a foundation that many years ago chose to aggregate its giving around a handful of high performing youth serving organizations. They then went out and syndicated essentially and got uh, created something called Blue Meridian, which now is a billion dollars of aggregated capital that it moves toward these organizations, including nurse home visiting programs. And I, th I think the answer is yes, that we, we need to do this. We've, we've taken a small step in that we've created something called a guarantee bank. We have about 13 foundations that have contributed uh, guarantees, the ability of of a foundation to use its balance sheet to guarantee the repayment of loans. It could gets very complicated. There are all sorts of ways of doing that. But we actually have about a $40 million guarantee bank that uh, will then move the guarantees, distribute the guarantees to housing CDFIs, environmental CDFIs, and small business CDFIs. And it's sort of our small step in that direction, but we could be doing much more. You know, one of the things we found, for example, just I didn't, I, too many examples, but during COVID, when um, the payroll protection program came down, um, as, as you all may know, it just wasn't getting to the smallest businesses. They just could not access it. It was, you know, it made sense. You would go to the banks and the banks would move it to the clients with whom they had pre-existing relationships. So we went out and got a CDFI that was a would be a qualified recipient of these PPP funds to redistribute. And we pre-lined up grantees in the queue and um, the CDFI went ahead and moved the money from its own balance sheet. We guaranteed its repayment by bridging to when the federal funds would come and it worked perfectly. We didn't lose a dime and our money was out uh, for perhaps two months only. Uh, and yet it, it permitted almost, I've forgotten how many, I think 65 different small businesses, very small businesses, micro businesses to get access to that PPP money. It's just an example of something that is not, that the private banking system is not set up to do. This is Anita Brown Glam and my apologies, I'm on the phone so I can't see who has their hand raised and I might be skipping ahead of people. So forgive the bad manners. <laughs> well, you talked a little bit about art and culture, and I'm wondering, given all that we experienced in 2020 and had to witness, mm -hmm. what you're thinking about the role of arts and culture in responding to trauma? Oh, it's a great question, and uh, I think 
it's one of the reasons I uh, elevated that as its own slide because I think the uh, the evidence is increasingly clear that it is pr of profound help as, as a healing device, as a prevention device, as a processing device. I'm not a medical doctor, but we have a medical doctor on staff uh, who has, has reinforced that message. She's felt that the, the programs in Detroit, she was the health director in the city of Detroit for many years, the programs that have been most effective in helping people get through crisis in the city of Detroit have been arts and culture programs. They speak to identity, they speak to different forms of expression, um, you know, all of the things that you might imagine. And I, you know, one of the things that that suggests too is that these six bodies of work are completely intertwined, right? I mean, that this is all part of a whole. I mean, Robert would Robert. Kennedy once said, you have to sort of grab the web whole. These, I, I don't mean to sort of segment the, the roles quite as dramatically as they got segmented because arts and culture can play a profoundly important role in, in the public health system. And even in the community development finance system, there are different ways of, of making sure that money flows to activities that again, traditional channels won't fund. So a long answer, but I, I think the, the, the potential power of arts and culture to be a healing um, agent in cases of trauma is, is impossible to overstate. If, if I could jump in, um, Mr. Rapson, as always, your presentation is amazing. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm particularly interested in what you have to say because I have a son living in Detroit and who Whoa. was, yes, involved in many of the things you're talking about. Huh. Um, but I, he comes from a small community where I live now, which is Greenville, South Carolina. Mm. Can you talk about mm. how in small communities mm. it could be the mo most effective to mobilize the limited philanthropic resources that we have here toward accomplishing the things? We don't have a yeah. Kresge or a Ford or anybody else down here. That's such a important question, Sue. And I don't know if I made it clear, but when I tried to transition from those nine modules with lots of activity and lots of investments, um, I, I do it because if you show that to a community other than Detroit, they just think that's impossible. We can't invest in light rail and a small business fund and you know all of these other things. And that's why I think that the, the pivot to roles is so important because I think particularly in a small community, whether it's Greenville or, um, or New Orleans, um, it's the, the roles that help move a community forward. And philanthropy doesn't have to play all of those roles. In some cases, it could be a chamber of commerce. In other cases, it could be a business association. But I, I do think this sort of question of reverse engineering saying, if here are a suite of problems we're trying to work on, how do we best set the table for the difficult conversations, role one? Are there ways that we can build the capacity of the community to hold this work? Maybe that's the Boys and the Girls Club, role two. Are there ways of reducing risk? Maybe that is a philanthropic tool because that is discretionary money that nobody else has. Can you actually identify some anchor investments that might lead us into a greater sense of confidence that there's stability, you know, on and on and on. So I think, I, I think I, 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 I put Kresge front and center in those six roles because it's kind of the way we've behaved in Detroit. And as you say, we have the, the privilege and the ability to be able to do all of those things simultaneously. But I, I would encourage any community in America to be thinking about who can play those roles and, 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 and how, is there some mechanism, it might be city hall, but it might be some other mechanism that can help provide coherence to them all. I mean, that's that framework notion that I ended with. Is there some way to holding the whole so that you don't become so scattershot that, that uh, you can't really get an additive effect? Yeah, that's helpful, thank you very much. Be creative in spreading out the roles and see who, who jumps in to take them on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank yeah. you. I have a question if I can chime in. Um, I'm not from Duke, but I'm working <laughs> on my dissertation that's about philanthropy role in community and economic development. 
Ah. And I have uh, one specific question about Kresge's uh, increase in investment in entrepreneurship. Yeah. And during COVID, it came to my mind, you know, small business, the survival rate for the first five years, not very high, even in the best possible circumstances. And with the COVID, it mm. just made me realize how are they faring? And then what's, um, what's philanthropic, philanthropic thoughts on how to get, actually boost but also help them sustain through these kind of tough times? What a, what a terrific question. Um, you know, as I've been reading some of the criticisms of the, of the federal relief package, it, it, it's maddening because how about the thousand businesses that mm -hmm. went out of business? Mm -hmm. This is too much money to help kind of resuscitate the small business ecology? I, didn't, it, I, I don't understand. In Detroit, we, um, in one of the early drawings, you'll see, we went to work on a small business fund called the, the, the um, New Economy Initiative, which was mm -hmm. a platform that aggregated philanthropic capital from a dozen different local and national foundations to try to promote small business development and entrepreneurship. There was almost no tradition of that in the city of Detroit. You know, Detroit was the city of automakers and they just sort of specked out what they needed. There was not a whole lot of room for entrepreneurship. And over the next decade, um, the contribution of the small business um, environment to Detroit's revival is impossible to overstate. I actually think it is the single most important thing that happened in the city of Detroit uh, is that these small businesses began popping up along corridors and neighborhoods, restaurants, quality of life, you know, you, you can imagine the, the full array. And so when COVID hit, I, I for one was terrified that all of that progress would have been lost. And when the federal money started flowing down, I became even more terrified because they were missing these small businesses. They were just simply not getting there. And so we went back to the new economy initiative and said, you know, your role really has to change. You have, an, you have a database of every small business in the city of Detroit, which they essentially do. Can we begin doing sort of customized intervention? Can we start figuring out ways to touch folks to understand, do they need a bridge loan? Do they need just... Um, some technical assistance to help them put their um, business on freeze for a while? Do they need some help to figuring out how to do um, uh, pickup work, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, I don't think we yet know how successful that has been, but um, I'm, my hope is that we've taken down the failure rate from probably just an astronomically high level to one that's painful, but manageable. I think the real question is how they get back on their feet um, or whether people have to start all over again. It's probably a combination of both. But I don't, I don't have specific numbers, but I, I actually think that's probably something we could, we could get for you. Um, this New Economy Initiative, the woman who runs New Economy Initiative has been trying to do exactly that. Inventory, who is there, who's not there any longer, who's expected to come back and who's gone forever. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sue Priester. Uh, she asks, can you please talk about how small communities with limited uh, philanthropic capacity can take on these roles? I think we, uh, we touched Already on that did. <laughs> just immediately before. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, though. And the next question is Kristen Goss. And she asks, if you were writing an article on philanthropy working with government, what would you say is the number one challenge and why? <laughs> Joel, why, why do your forums always ask these impossibly difficult questions? Nobody else does this to me. I don't know. God. <laughs> they, they have a sense of your wisdom. That's why. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I would love other people's um, response to that, because it's tempting to, to list four or five things. And part of that reverse osmosis gets at it, is that government has to, I think, get into a mindset of taking barriers away and creating enabling environments. But the, the, I think the single thing I would say that will be most difficult is the difficulty that City Hall has in relinquishing its uh, command and control mindset. 
that they're in charge, they have the election certificate, they will therefore drive the city's work. And obviously to a, an enormous extent, that's true. I mean, it, it, that, that they do have the election certificate, they have the legitimacy of, of office and that over, over time, we simply have to line up behind the, the broad priorities of the public sector, but they change and they often are partial. I think we're in an era, if there's nothing else you take from my slides, it's in, we're in an era of distributive leadership. There is no way that we can crack the code of these really tough issues, whether it's small business development or racial equity or anything else without understanding that the private sector has a role to play, the public sector has a role to play, the philanthropic sector has a role to play, and residents have a role to play. And uh, I, I, I actually think, uh, maybe I should just speak for Detroit. Detroit has a really hard time with that. We have a very long tradition of very powerful mayors who are not accustomed to sharing power. I think this mayor does a better job at that than, than previous mayors have, but still it's sort of a legacy issue for someone who um, for all intents and purposes has to uh, show that he or she is in charge. And so I, I have tried at Kresge to reinforce the idea that everything we do is in service of the public sector, but they simply have to permit others to get into the mix, to identify problems that, that may not be the immediate priority of City Hall, to try to figure out ways of engaging citizens in ways that may be uncomfortable for City Hall, in trying out solution sets that are different from what the, the public sector might uh, try to do. And perhaps most importantly, because this in, in many ways trumps everything, permitting non-public sector entities to implement your agenda. You cannot implement a housing agenda, a small business agenda, um, or any other agenda in the city of Detroit without the nonprofit sector. You just can't do it. That's where the housing is being built. That's where the small business incentives are being formulated. And when Ryan and I were talking earlier about early childhood development, you've got to rely on the Kellogg foundations and the private sector uh, community health providers and the um, foundations of Detroit to help make your priorities stick. So, sorry, a long answer. I think the biggest challenge is helping us all understand that municipal leadership is distributed leadership and that we all have to kind of uh, become a little bit more flexible, swim outside our lane, get comfortable with people being in lanes that we feel are exclusively ours. Rip, on one of your earlier talks, I remember very clearly for having talked about what you did to, in, to engage the federal government, I think during the, the Obama administration. To what extent have you, and this the Biden administration is young at this point uh, and they've got other things they're trying to do, but they, I can't believe that they're not um, sympathetic with what you're describing. And the question is, have you, have you had any luck getting any, and of course you're willing now just getting the agencies with heads appointed and so it's hard to deal with an agency that doesn't have a secretary but <laughs> but but many of them half of them have now um and so the have you have you have you started trying to figure out how to get the federal government involved somehow in support of your view of how this needs to be done that's such a good question joel the, the reason i used the particular slide i did was that I think that if what we brought to the federal government was not just what have we done in Detroit, they've been there, they've done that, they've been enormously helpful and I think they will be again, however they can, but we're just one city of a thousand. I think what we would love to try to figure out how to do is to take um, 10 cities, 15 cities that are all relatively poor cities, um, are not you know high uh, resource cities, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, um, and, and understand whether there aren't patterns of need and patterns of opportunity that the federal government can attach to. And again, that's why I put that little box in that, that, that sort of suggests that they can do that in one of two ways. They can get rid of a bunch of obstacles to doing what we wanna do, um, or they can actually affirmatively try to create something that's helpful. Maybe just a quick example of that. When, when Detroit was uh, in its bankruptcy, 
Sean Donovan, there's a very complicated story that I won't bother you with, but essentially Sean Donovan, the secretary of HUD, wanted to know how to be helpful to the city in remediating its blight and abandonment. Uh, and we presented him with a whole suite of, of ideas. Every single one of them, literally every single one of them violated some federal HUD regulation or policy or practice. And he one by one figured out how to lift every single one. A simple example was that you couldn't use community development block grants for certain kinds of activities like blight removal. He just removed that requirement and we use CDBG to take down blighted and abandoned homes. And so I'm hoping that through this mechanism of aggregating city experience um, and doing pattern identification that you'll have in this in administration, people who will be really tuned into the possibilities. I mean, look at the HUD secretary, she was a mayor. Look at the transportation secretary, he was a mayor. These folks are going to, uh, I think, have enormous receptivity to how hard it is to assemble these complex solutions at the local level and how, how they might begin to aggregate across multiple places. And if they can do it in 15 cities, you can do it in 50 cities. And if you could do it in 50 cities, you can do it in 100 cities. So I think there are ways in which um, that conversation um, has been opened. Uh, we're fortunate in, in that we have uh, a couple of trustees who are deeply connected into the, the new administration. And I, I, so I'm hoping that we'll have something of an open channel of communication with them. Uh, Rip, I had a speaker this morning uh, to my class. John Rice, who started, you know, John, yes. uh, who started management leadership for tomorrow. And he said something that I thought was interesting that may be relevant. And you may, probably have already thought about it. But he said, you know, his sister, uh, Susan Rice, uh, is now uh, taking a major role in some of these issues that you're dealing with. And she, from what I know about Susan, I, th I would assume that she would be very sympathetic to the idea that... Uh, that you just articulated about trying to figure out a, a kind of a poly pro pilot program for 15 cities. Have I you, hope so. have I you hope talked so. to Susan at all about it? Uh, um, I, I, th I think it's okay to say, um, one of our trustees is Cecilia Munoz. Cecilia okay. ran the transition for domestic and economic policy. And I spoke with, uh, uh, Cecilia about exactly this. I said, why would you put a foreign policy expert in charge of the Domestic Policy Council? <laughs> and she said essentially exactly what you said, Joel. Is it because she's, she's not hidebound, she's not beholden to anybody, and she's a terrific problem solver. So she is going to be all over the possibility of identifying ways in which the federal government can be more flexible and essentially do a Sean Donovan to basically say, what do you need to be successful? And where are we in the way? And where do you want us to, to help in, in different ways? Now, I don't know Ms. Rice personally, but from what Cecilia tells me, she's gonna be a godsend. That's my, that's my intuition. Elwood, you're smiling here. I was so delighted to see you all the way from Los Angeles in this, in this. I didn't know about your connection with the with the uh, Kresge Foundation, but we can't let you be here and not say something. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm actually taking notes today. It's good to see you too, Joel. And I'm very proud of my association with Kresge these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, not, not, no ideas <laughs> yet? <laughs> um, well, all of it, um, I really do think that already Rips, uh, he's being modest, but there's already been a kind of uh, change in the discourse around national policy among many people we know who are moving from the Urban Institute to the Domestic Policy Council and so on. And I think, um, you know, typically this moment in time is always about what are the specific ideas for policies and policy prescriptions that we can say worked well in one place and now get replicated. And I do think that what RIP has been um, working on in terms of identifying the patterns of, um, of, of what systems need to look like and how the mechanisms of problem solving in Detroit, how they can be brought to scale uh, in a lot of cities is already that kind of osmosis underway. Um, and, and so I think, you know, RIP, you're being modest in terms of all of the 
leadership, the, the influence you've had on so many thinkers who are now in positions of power, that some of what you're describing as a what if, I think is already beginning to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's just the truth. Thank you. Jane. I, I have a question for you uh, and a thought. I love the idea of all of these large cities, but I come from a small county in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, the, one of the things we find, um, at least when you look at philanthropy, two things we'd like to see you consider, and that is talk to philanthropy about doing this. Um, for the first time ever that I can recall philanthropy now with legislation that not everyone likes, the, uh, the uh, opportunity zones can invest in those. And we've been able to get philanthropy uh, to begin to look at rural counties and investment with the community foundations, et cetera. And so that's um, the other thing is, how can you look at all of the policy at the federal government and look at the ways you can communicate, for example, between the Appalachian Regional Commission mm -hmm. and the Community Development Block Grants so that they can work together? Um, and so those are policy prescriptions where you can really look across the federal government and say, how do we create the linkages of the grants that enable what you want to do in the cities, but also in the counties? Yeah, I, 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 I take that as, a, as just a, a really powerful suggestion. Um, how, um, you know, Secretary Vilsack um, is particularly good at this sort of cross-braiding, the Secretary of Agriculture. Um, and my sense is that if there is a quality to this administration is that these folks are really good systems thinkers. And I think what you're describing is trying to think in more in terms of systems and interconnections among systems. And frankly, uh, we've been a little bit guilty of not doing that at Kresge uh, when we brought in um, a director of our human development work, our human services work. She was the former uh, a commissioner for the Tennessee Department of Health and Human Services. And she came and made a very similar point. She said, you cannot do this work and not have one eye on counties. We tend to focus on urban areas. It's just our, our mission. But she said, you know, counties become this really important pivot point because they radiate out in all sorts of ways that even city halls cannot. And they often have uh, a jurisdiction over functions that city halls do not. And so you've really got to make sure that you keep your eye on, on, the, on the network of counties. Um, but I, uh, the, the, the other piece of this is I, um, I, I'm trying to th think back on um, uh, a conversation I, I had with a guy named Carl Stauber, who uh, runs you know, a, a, a regional <laughs> foundation focused uh, in the South. And, uh, he and um, uh, David Dodson, who has yep. often come to um, Joel's seminars, had put together a, an effort to try to encourage philanthropy to, to spread its wings into rural, the rural South in particular, much more. Um, and I think they've made some gains, but not, not enough. So it's two parts to the question, I, I couldn't agree more. That philanthropy has to figure out how to work in rural America. And it, we need to think of counties as really the essential building blocks for that work. Absolutely. David has started an organization, David Dodson started an organization called the Passing Philanthropy, um, um, what, Passing Gear Philanthropy yep. Institute. Yep. Uh, and he's spending full time at it. And what he's done is to knit a number, to get knit together a number of foundations scattered across the South, uh, all from different states, that do work, I think, with counties and uh, as well. Yes, yeah, David is brilliant, and I think the work is has huge potential. Thank you. For your I'm not sure that's completely responsive, Jean. I'm sorry, but no, it's a that was question. very good. I just want I want philanthropy to open up its eyes. Yeah, yeah, see yeah. See how yeah. they can be involved, and 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 we we held a meeting in our state and worked with. Um, philanthropy, bringing together small businesses and uh, counties that wanted more broadband. And it was opening their eyes to the fact mm. that they could do this. And um, so I trust you will move on some to some of that as well. Could I, jo Joel, I started to, to continue, but um, one of the slides uh, had a point that I didn't 
pro probably emphasize sufficiently. And that is during COVID, the, the, the important, critically important role of community foundations, I think, came to the surface. The people who were aggregating these funds, the people who were organizing relief efforts, the people who were communicating out new uh, programs and, and uh, channels of distribution were almost always the community foundations, right. not just the big ones, the little ones, it, whether yeah. it was Fresno or Detroit or Asheville, you know, it, it, and I, I think to Jane's point, there, there is a huge potential for our community foundations to kind of move beyond just being passive donor advised funds. That's important. You've got to service people's desire to move capital into nonprofits, but they can also increasingly be something of a steward for community vision and for community um, engagement. And I, and I, as I think of your question, Jane, I, I immediately go to sort of the community-based foundations. More than national philanthropy, they have all sorts of pathologies that <laughs> don't need to go into, but but I think local philanthropy can be a really powerful, they have their ear to the ground, they have local connections, they have legitimacy within their own community, and they have that broader look. They understand the connection of a city to a county to a, um, a rural region. So. Well, you know, maybe you should talk to Paul Grogan, stepping down, you know, as he's now no longer the president of the Boston Foundation, but he's very interested in this question. Uh, and. Uh, I, I think he may have some spare time on his hands. He does, and he has used it to talk to me. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. You yeah. beat, me, beat me to the punch. <laughs> twist, twisting my arm. Yeah, they, they, they are trying to stand up more effectively a national consortium of community foundations that are trying to lean more uh, aggressively into some of these larger community questions. And, you know, I bet one of the foundations in North Carolina would be very sympathetic. Um, the, the Foundation for the Carolinas uh, out of Charlotte, which is the largest community foundation, I think, in North and South Carolina, in any event. Um, and the president of it is would be very sympathetic, I think, to what you've talked about. Indeed. I think that's all the questions that I have, unless anyone wants to jump in. Thank you all for your your patience, um, Joel. I uh, uh, I can we can certainly send you copies uh, of the slides if people would like them. Um, some of you mean oh some some nodding of heads, some saying yes. not years don't even think about it. Um, but we're happy to make those available. Why don't you send them? Send send it by email. You. You do emails of them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mine yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just send you a PowerPoint if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, no, send us send a PowerPoint. Uh, send it to Cassie and, or, or Imani. And Imani will get it to Cassie in any event. And Cassie can be the recipient for any requests people would like to get copies of it. Great. Great. They, they are a little bit better when you can see them better. I had no trouble scrutinizing them <laughs> on the Zoom. So don't, don't, okay. don't, it All was right. very successful. Was they were not too, the print was not too little. I oh. could make them yeah, out. They were very clear. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice to hear it. Thank you. I'm glad. Well, as I, as I said at the beginning um, to Joel, I think it's before others got on. Um, since we've been working at home, um, I've done almost no drawings. But uh, because this is such a command performance for Professor Fleischman, I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure he would have severed my contract had I, had I not come up with some drawings. So uh, this well, is- I, I, I wouldn't, that's an extreme position to take. I would never do that. But nonetheless, uh, it is wonderful to have you and the, and the drawings. Uh, and in case the people don't remember, the reason that Rip is so good at this, the drawings, is that his father was an architect. And I don't know, did your father teach you drawing? No, I, I, I wish he had, they wouldn't be quite so primitive. <laughs> I don't, they don't strike me as primitive. They're very avant-garde. Very, <laughs> very, very true, very sophisticated. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, listen, I'm, anybody have a, we have three minutes left. Um, I, I hate to th not use the three, three minutes, but. If anybody would ask, have a question, one of the students in my class is here, Jerry, 
Do you have a question you would you would like to ask, um, uh, Rafson? Um, no, I don't think so. I learned a lot. Um, thank you for for your wisdom. Thank you. Riff is, to get through it. Thank you. Riff is an MBA student in the in the Fuqua School at Duke. Oh, terrific. Joel, I think we could renew our request, which I think was made last time for Rip to move to North Carolina. Yes. <laughs> Detroit Absolutely. has had it too long. I, I, this is more tempting than you may know. Yeah. This, <laughs> well, we can I make it a lot more tempting. Just give us a chance. Oh, it, it's such beautiful country. I, every time I come, I'm just, my head spins. Well, this, it's not as cold here as it is in Michigan, and you don't have as much snow here as you do in Michigan. So there are two good imports, and the people are not and nice in Michigan, I'm sure. But the people, <laughs> the people, They're nicer here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I, I, I don't like to make invidious comments like that. <laughs> but in any event, uh, thank you all for coming. Rip, again, you, you've done a masterful job in what I asked you to do. Uh, and I think all of us are conscious of how um, your being taking the lead there, even before um, Detroit exploded, and actually preparing the ground for dealing with the explosion, was just in a very, very important role to play. Uh, and so uh, more power to you. Um, get those people talking to one another, get the federal government involved, get the community foundations involved. And I'm sure I'll think of other things to ask you. <laughs> okay. But in any event, uh, thank you. Very, you you were wonderful as always. Thank you, and thank thank you. you all for your patience. Thank Deep, you. Deeply thank grateful. And you have us, we'll get you back here in another two years and you can tell, then you'll have a, have a chance to see what the, uh, uh, Biden Foundation is the Biden administration has done, and I hope it'll be great and to your liking. That would be great. <laughs> Good. Thank you all very much. Thank you very, mu very you. much. Very much. Wonderful to see you. Keep smiling and keep that wonderful radiance about yourself. <laughs>